Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first official lecture of the class. The first video just was an overview of the class. So this is your first official lecture video. So we're going to break the class uh, this week into two different lectures. We're going to start with the concept of what is criminal justice? Um, like, how do we define it, the system, the structure, the process? And then we'll move into what we call the foundations of criminal justice. We'll talk about what are some of the fun fundamental principles involved in criminal justice. Um, so we'll break it down into those two lectures. Okay, so we are going to start um, today talking about uh, some basic definitions and how, you know, how to view this whole class. So like I said today, before, this is administration to criminal justice. This should be one of the last classes that you're taking. Um, and the reason why we're studying administration, because hopefully at some point in your career, all of you will eventually move up the ranks and be a boss. And so the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today, okay? So just as a review, we have talked throughout all of the different classes about the three different parts of the criminal justice process or system, okay? So we've been studying criminal justice. What are the three parts of that make up criminal justice in our country? So hopefully all of you immediately in your head said police, courts, and corrections, okay? So the three parts of criminal justice in this country are always police, courts, and corrections. So just like we looked at those three in intro, we're going to now revisit them again in administration. So one of the concepts we talked about in introduction is how well do these three parts interact with each other? Many people view criminal justice as a consensus model, that the three parts all work together and they are solely trying to achieve justice. They're, they all have the same goal of justice. They all cooperate with each other and they all work together peacefully because they're trying to achieve justice. Other people think that the three components are really self-serving and they're really only looking out for themselves. So there's kind of a conflict between the three. They're each trying to compete for limited resources, limited um, um, supplies and things like that. And they are each kind of trying to show that they're the most important part of criminal justice. So it's more of a conflict model. Okay, so those are the two different ways that people view how these three parts actually work together for criminal justice. Now, when we start with criminal justice, we start with intro and we're really just starting with the basic concepts and terms and structures of the criminal justice system. So we're really at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. We're really talking about remembering and trying to understand the terminology, the concepts, the structure, how they're organized, what their duties and responsibilities are. So that's kind of the lowest level on Bloom's taxonomy. As we worked our way through criminal justice, we start with more in-depth analysis. We start applying the laws, we start analyzing the laws. Now we're at the end of criminal justice and we're going to start evaluating the system and creating our new poli our own policies and procedures on how the system should function. So that's kind of how we have progressed through the criminal justice system. Now you're up at create and evaluate for this class. Basically, you're going to be doing a higher level analysis at, in this class. We now know how they're each um, structured and how they work together or don't work together and their duties and responsibilities. We're going to take all of that and put it together and we're really going to start analyzing each of these three parts, not just remembering what they do, but really delving into what are some of the issues and problems that each of these three parts have to deal with. Uh, how do they handle these issues? What do they do? What, what, how do they make decisions? How do they interact? How does their interaction affect each other? So we're really going to take it up a huge notch and really talk about analyzing the three parts much more than just understanding how they work. Okay, so to get started, the first thing we have to do is understand what is administration. So we're in justice administration. So we need to define administration. What is administration? So administration is defined as the process or activity of running a business or organization. That's all it is. How is the business or organization 
um, and, um, run? How do they operate day-to-day business in that um, organization? So we are going to be talking about the business organizations of criminal justice. So the police departments, the court system, and prisons and jails, corrections. How are they run? What are the processes or activities that are used to operate them from an administrative perspective? Okay, handling employees. What are some of the employee issues? What are the concepts that go into it? How is it gonna be structured? How do we make decisions? So some of those deeper analytical processes, that's what we're going to be talking about. How this thing runs on a day-to-day basis. So why are we studying this? Like I said before, I'm hoping that all of you when you get into criminal justice are going to want to climb the ladder. You're eventually gonna wanna move up within your organization and you need to have an understanding of how administration works so you can operate at that higher level. And this is just a quote, administration is far too important than to be left to on the job training or to one's personal idiosyncrasies or ideals. Concisely put, today's leaders must know their people, the current trends and issues of the day, how to deal with related challenges. So we're going to introduce those concepts to you. If you're going to be successful in this field, you have to understand these problems, the people that work there, the issues, how to make decisions, how to come up with policies and procedures. And instead of just throwing you into the job and having you figure it out, we're going to introduce these concepts to you. So when you get there, you already have an understanding on how to make these decisions, okay? Now, when you're talking about administration, you're talking about three main levels of players, okay? So all the, when we're talking administration, the top people that are running the business, we can break those down into three main layers. So the administrator is the top person in the organization. That is going to be the person that comes up with the policies and proceed the policies for the department. So you're the chief of police. You are the um, su- uh, the sheriff. You are the administrative judge. You are the superintendent or a warden of a um, prison. You make the policies on how that department is going to run. You're the administrator, you create policy. Then you have managers. Managers are the people that are gonna come up with the procedures to carry out the administrator's policies. So the administrator comes up with the policy, the manager is the one that comes up with the procedures on how the workers are going to carry out those policies. And then the supervisor is the one that watches over the base employees every day to assure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, understanding those definitions, let's put it to work. So if I give you these three, you decide, are they an administrator, a manager, or supervisor? So read through each and write down if you think they're a supervisor, a manager, or administrator. Stop the video, and then when you're done, start it again and see if you got it right. So hopefully you got them right. So Harris orders the the detectives to report to dispatch every hour, at least to comply with the chief's policy. The procedures to carry out a policy is a manager. Chief Jax decides to implement a policy. That's your administrator. And the person that supervises on a day-to-day basis, that's your supervisor. So hopefully you understand the different levels of players that exist within administration. If you want a little more more review, I posted a practice assessment online that you can go and practice and make sure you got those concepts in your head. Now, when we talk about criminal justice, there are different theories of what it really is. What is criminal justice? How do we describe the structure that makes up criminal justice? There are different models that people use to describe criminal justice. Some people say it's a system. Some people say, no, 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 it's more of a process. And some people say, no, 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 it's not either one of those. It's more of a network of different agencies or departments. So let's look at each of those. So the first one is a system. Some people argue that it is a system. A system means that all three are all in one big ball. They're all part of each other. They're all interconnected. And what happens is if one person makes a decision, since they're intricately connected, it affects all the others, okay? Think about conjoined twins. 
right? Maybe you're conjoined with somebody by the arm. When you move this arm, it's going to affect that person. That's a system. They're all connected. They're all joined in some way. And any of their decisions affect all of the other um, parts. Some people believe since it's a system, it's more of a conflict model. Since they're all connected, they're all kind of fighting and control, trying to control the rest of the others. They're all trying to get the resources because there's only this pool of resources. So they're all trying to grab and get the most of the resources that they can possibly get. Now that's a system. Other people believe it's just a process, right? That you just have a, a series of events that end at the end and it's just a process. So criminal justice is just a process. First you get arrested, have a crime, then you're arrested, then you get interviewed and then you have charges against you and then you go to court and then you're sentenced. And it's just a step-by-step -step process. They don't really think of it as interconnected um, people or agencies, okay? It's just a series of events. Other people think it's just a network. So they're not directly connected. They're just kind of individual separated agencies that all do kind of network or work kind of closely together, but they're not directly connected to each other, okay? So we have this concept of justice in the middle, and then there's just these separate agencies that kind of exist, and they all kind of do their own thing to get to justice, but they don't have that interconnection that the um, system says they do. Now, people believe in network think it tends to be more consensus since they're not intricately connected. They're not in a finite amount of resources that they can all kind of work together for justice. So networks are viewed much more along the line of consensus model. Some people say it's not. It's just this random group of agencies or groups. They don't work harmoniously together. They're not coordinated. They're not structured. They're not efficient. They're not fair. And they don't achieve justice. Um, many people argue since it's so disorganized and so unstructured that criminal justice is heading for a major crisis and a major breakdown. So they don't feel that it's either one of those three things. It's just kind of this random thing that's not functioning properly. And a lot of people that advocate for criminal justice reform see it in this way. So think about it. Well, how do you vision, visualize it? When you are thinking about criminal justice, do you see it more as a system interconnected, a process, a series of events, a network is just randomly things, or do you think it's just so uncoordinated and unstructured that it's really nothing and it's not achieving justice? Well, how you see it will affect what policies and procedures you would pick as an administrator. So administrators' policies and procedures are affected by their perception of the criminal justice system. So if you think it's a system, you're going to be very cautious of the choices you make that could affect the other parts. If you just think of it as a process, you're only going to carry about your particular step. And you're not going to think about the others. If you're a network, you're just going to kind of, you know, be out there doing your own thing and not necessarily always worrying about how it affects other people. So an administrator's perspective on this can affect the policies and procedures that they ultimately make. All of these things are affected by what we call planned change. And that's basically what we're gonna be doing through the rest of the semester in our research project. We're gonna be talking about planned change. You're gonna be choosing a criminal justice issue and it's going to have an effect on one of the parts of the criminal justice system, police courts or corrections. And you have to understand if you make a policy change in those, it's gonna have an effect on other parts. So whenever you make a change, you have to make sure it's a rational, thought out, planned change. You have to think about the ripple effect that these, this change is going to have on the whole system. So planned change is a rational approach to criminal justice planning. So you don't just make up a decision off the top of your head and say, okay, we're going to switch police from eight hour to 12 hour shifts. Just off the top of your head, you're going to do that. You can't do that. It affects too many people when you're the administrator. 
So you need to research it. You need to see what other departments are doing and how they're doing it. You have to see how successful it's gonna, it's been. You have to analyze what problems can this create? What difficulties are you gonna have? What are your employees gonna say? You have to set goals and objectives. So you don't just pick policies off the top of your head and make these decisions. You have to think through this rational process of how your choices are going to affect lots of other people. One of the things with that planned change is this idea of rocking the boat analysis. So the idea is you cannot rock one end of the boat without rocking the other. So whether you view it as a system or a network or a process, you have to understand that police courts and corrections are connected in some way. So any policy changes that are made at any one of these is going to rock the boat for the other parts, okay? So any policy decisions or changes that are made within criminal justice in one agency have a direct effect on what's happening in the other agencies. And you have to be able to see that interconnectivity. So let's think about how this would work. So you're police and you receive grants to increase patrol and arrest in a lower income urban area of a city. So you have all this money, you're a police chief, you have all this money, you can pay, you can hire more officers, you can increase patrols and you can make much more arrests. And it's all gonna occur in this lower income area. What are the ripple effects of that? What effect is that gonna have on the court system if you have a lot more arrests all of a sudden coming in all at the same time? Are they gonna be able to handle it? Do they have enough judges? Do they have enough juries? Do they have enough prosecutors? Do they have enough defense attorneys? And then if you have more trials, you're ultimately going to have more convictions. Can your prison system handle this? What should we be doing with these people if they're convicted? Should we be locking that many people up? What's the ripple effect on corrections? So that's what I mean by this rocking the boat analysis. Whenever you make changes, you have to figure out how those changes affect all the other parts of the criminal justice system. Here's another one. Supreme Court decides that um, a suspected uh, terrorist does not have constitutional rights. So if you're a suspected terrorist, you don't get constitutional rights. How does that affect what police do now when they're investigating these crimes? What ripple effect does it have within the police department? What effect does that have on corrections? You may have more people arrested, less rights, less things they have to worry about. They could be in jail longer periods of time. How is corrections gonna handle that? So you have to see how that decision has a ripple effect through the other branches. And then the last one, prison administrators release nonviolent drug offenders after a third of their sentence. So if prisons decide on this new policy, yep, we're not keeping them after a third, we're letting them out. What effect does that have on the streets and then police making arrests for judge, judge uh, drug charges? And what do the courts say about this and how is this gonna affect the court system? So you really need to see how these three parts are interconnected. That's called the rocking the boat analysis and you have to understand that analysis. That is your discussion for this week. You need to go to my GCC, you need to participate in the chapter one discussion and you will be doing a rocking the boat analysis, okay? So that is the end of your first lecture. Hopefully you understand. If you have any cons or questions, please reach out. I'll be happy to go over any concepts that you're confused on, um, but welcome to the class. I hope you like it. And we will move on into the next lecture talking about some of the fundamental principles within the system that you need to kind of review and remember as part of an analysis of making policies and procedures. I'll see you soon.